charge in Ezra, but we're just going to end in Ezra as well. So <laughs> if you have a Bible, go to Ezra. If you uh, have a phone or some electronic device with a Bible on it, uh, find where it, where it has the book of Ezra. We're going to start in chapter 1 there. We've been in a series called uh, Unsung Heroes, and my focus for today is just typical household name, an individual many of you have no doubt named your children after, have relatives who have this name, and, you know, just like use the name on a regular basis, Zerubbabel. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, Zerubbabel is not well known, but he is in the Bible, and he did something significant, and what I want to communicate to you and suggest that you, um, that you follow in his example is his perseverance. So we're, we're looking at Zerubbabel's perseverance. And to begin, let's go to Ezra chapter 1, verse 3. The year is 538 B.C., before Christ, or B.C.E., if you're familiar with that. So, you know, five and a half centuries before Christ, this is, this is a long time ago. We're in the age of empires. The Babylonians had conquered the world, and now the Persians had conquered the Babylonians. And the Persian king is Cyrus. It says in Ezra 1.3, Let any of those among you who are of his people may their God be with them, go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, or Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is the God who was in Jerusalem. So the people of Israel had been taken out of their land by the Babylonian Empire, had migrated far away to the Babylonian Empire to a number of different, uh, I don't know what you would call them, refugee camps, or uh, they were immigrants in cities, just kind of a, a difficult life where it's a different culture, the language is a little different, and the gods are different, the religion is different, significantly different. And so after 70 years, this king conquers the Babylonian Empire, this King Cyrus, and he says to all the peoples that have been moved, he says, you can all go home now, anybody who wants to. Now, I don't know how many... Uh, of you, how long you have been living where you're currently living. Have you been, li is there anyone here that's been, that is currently living where they are, or that is living where they've been living for 50 years? I've been in my house about 10. It feels like 50 years, 10 or 11 years. You know, maybe some of you have been in your house 20 years or apartment 20 years or, you know, but even 50 years would be just, a, a, you know, a lifetime, right? And these people have been in Babylon 70 years. So let's face it, almost everyone has never even been to Israel. They've never even been to their ancestral land. All they know is this Babylonia, and why do they necessarily want to go home? They are home. This is where they were born and raised, right? But something incredible happened, and 50,000 people responded. 50,000 people said, I'm going back. I'm going back to the homeland, even though it's a 900-mile journey through a, through a very hot climate with a caravan of people that is fraught with danger. I, sign me up. I'm going. This is like uh, whenever, if ever, they, uh, they, they open up tourism to the moon or to Mars. These are those people that are like, all right, I'm, I'm going. Uh, yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're the early adopters, the, the, this first 50,000. And uh, it's, just, it's just an incredible distance. Babylonia is not really near Israel. It's, uh, it's over here. This is Babylon. And, and the thing is, Israel is, is right over here um, in this region. Let me get a different color. That didn't work. Yeah, so they're probably heading over to, to this region of Israel here. So you think, okay, we'll just, uh, we'll just go right here, a couple hundred miles, no problem. Well, guess what? It's all desert. Nobody goes that way. You can't make it. So they, what they do is they go all the way up and then all the way down, 900 miles. Just takes forever. Takes forever to get there. 
and they do it. They have elderly people and children. There are seven. It is, I love how they count all the animals. They're like, we've got 736 horses. Okay, well, that's good to know. 245 mules, 435 camels, but 6,720 donkeys. You know, I guess donkeys were like very highly prized by, you know, they're like the moving truck of the ancient world, right? You get yourself a donkey, put some stuff on it. Come on, buddy. Let's go. And they're doing that for 900 miles. Can you imagine this? Just incredible. 2,500 years ago. And who led these people? Was it Ezra? No, no. Ezra came later. Was it Nehemiah? No. It was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel led these people back. Can you imagine that kind of a job? Have you ever planned a, a vacation that lasted a long time? You know, maybe after a week or two week vacation? Or uh, have you ever planned moving to another place? <laughs> you know, all the logistics that goes into that. Uh, what about moving far away to, uh, to another state or another country? This is really what they're talking about here. So this is, this is a logistical uh, challenge, and Zerubbabel is up to the task. So these people are moving far away, and it says in Ezra chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Then the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred. I love that phrase got ready to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. You see, it. the, the people are, have heard the stories about good old Solomon. Now, Solomon is another 500 years before these guys. And Solomon had built this incredible temple in Jerusalem, and, and it, was, it was just sort of one of the, the great sights in all the world. People would come from far away just to see the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem that Solomon had built. Gold and extravagant marble, it was just gorgeous. And it had been destroyed. So now Cyrus says, everybody who wants to go back, you can go back, you can build a house to your God who lives in Jerusalem. The way Cyrus looks at it as a polytheist, he worships his own gods, but he thinks that there are gods of the lands. So this people group has their God, this people group has their God, and the Jewish people group, they have their God that lives in Jerusalem. So let me, just, let me just endorse them to go back because then, you know, they can worship their God in their land and then they can pray for me because I'm such a nice king and, you know, I'll get the benefit. It was never like all so, it wasn't altruistic really. It was like, let's just really get the gods on my side here by sending all these people back. And it says, everyone whose spirit God had stirred got ready to go. That's pretty cool. So you have many Jewish people who stayed in Babylon, probably the majority, and then you had 50,000 who said, I will go, I want to I be on the cutting edge, I want to build this temple. Those whose spirit God has stirred. So after months and months, they finally arrive in their ancestral towns. They don't all live in Jerusalem where the temple is going to be built. They're, they're from different parts of the country. Uh, one's from Bethlehem, another one is from Hebron, another one is from some other place, you know, and, and they're going back to all these different places, but then they gather together in the seventh month. In chapter 3, we can read about that. They gather in the seventh month to celebrate a festival in Jerusalem. Now, there's no temple, but they know where the temple is supposed to be, right? So that's where they go. They go to where it used to be before it got destroyed. Ezra chapter 3, verse 2, we read, Then Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, with his... Oh, by the way, Omar, great job on pronouncing these very difficult words. <laughs> you know, like you nailed it. Anyhow. Um, then Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundation because they were in dread of the people of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings upon it to the Lord morning and evening. Seventy years, nobody sacrificed. Seventy years, the temple was destroyed, and the way the, the Jewish religion worked is that you had to only, you could only sacrifice, you could only 
make animal sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. You can't do it in Babylon. You can't do it down the street. There's one place to do it. There's an official group of people who are specifically trained. They're called Levites. And of the Levites, there's a small subset who trace their family back to Aaron. And they're the priests. And they know how to do the sacrifices. You can't even make your own. You can't, you can't just like worship God. That's just not how it's set up. You have to bring an animal to a professionally trained and, and like of the right descendants uh, of the right ancestry, and then you can offer a sacrifice. So none of this has happened, and now they're finally back in the land, and guess what? They brought the Levites. They brought the priests. You know, they, these people know how to do it, and they have all these animals, and they're just like, you know what? Let's offer a sacrifice to our God. And it says that they were also in dread. You see that in verse 3? It says they were in dread of the people of the lands. Can you imagine a refugee returning home after the war? That's what's going on here. We have a group of refugees returning home after the war. But nobody's been taking care of things. So you've got all kinds of randos that moved in and other people that hid in a cave or something and never left. You know, so you don't understand really what the, you know, the situation is. I bet your house is is probably occupied, or if it's not occupied, nobody's kept, kept it up. So it's all, you know, uh, you know uh, worn out and, you know, from the sun, from the rain, from the elements, right? I, I fix my house all the time, and it's still worn out from uh, just usage, right? Um, so you get there, and there's, there are other people there. And they're not Jewish people, but they're, they're, uh, they're interested but they're also antagonistic. And, and there's no, you have no military. You literally don't even have a temple building. Like you're worshiping outside where the temple used to be. All you have set is an altar. And there's no wall. They're, they're very exposed. It's a very dangerous uh, position to be in. And there's so much to do. Everyone's got to build their houses. You've got to build your house or fix your old house. You've got to clear land. You've got to get ready to plant seed because there's no grocery stores. This is the ancient world. You've got to grow your own food. You've got to get a wall. You've got to organize a nation. But first, let's worship God. So that's what they did. They came together and they worshiped God. And God, see the thing is God had taken them out of idolatry and um, uh, brought them to this land and said, I want you to worship me and worship me alone. And the people did not stay faithful to their God. They worshiped the other gods. And so God said, all right, well, I own the land, newsflash, and you're my tenants, and I'm evicting you from the land because you're disobeying me. So they got evicted for 70 years. Now they're back. The very first thing they're doing is, we want to make sure we worship God correctly and not other gods. And you know what? So far as I can tell, they never went to any other gods after this. You know, they were, they were solid for the next you know, 2,600 years or however many years it's been, um, they, they've been solid on that. Uh, maybe there are some exceptions to that, but uh, that was really important to them. Look at verse 7. So they gave money. We're going to build this temple. You guys ready? So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant they had from King Cyrus of Persia. In the second year, after their arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel and Jeshua son of Josadak made a beginning together with the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and up to have oversight, oversight over the work on the house of Yahweh. So they are ready to get going. They've got, uh, you've heard of the cedars of Lebanon. They're like, we're going to use the cedars of Lebanon to build this temple. So we have a grant from the king. We're going to get everything shipped down because you don't want to bring big, big lumber down, you know, on a land, right? So what they do is they bring it out to the ocean and they ship it down and then they bring it on land. As, uh, as little as possible 
because, you know, lumber's heavy. So they get everything working, they get the foundation laid, and they said, you know what, let's, I know all we did was the foundation, but let's just stop and celebrate. You know, like just getting to this point was a lot. And they stopped and they celebrated, and the priests put on their vestments. They have this special clothing that they would never wear back in Babylon, but now that they're in the promised land, they're in the area of the temple, they're in an official capacity serving the Lord, they get to wear their priestly garments, and they, they have trumpets that they're blowing, and it says the Levites praised with cymbals. So we're making noise. Cymbals is like one of the loudest instruments you can have, and trumpets, right? Trumpets and cymbals. It says in verse 11, and they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord had been laid. That line, praise the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever, that is a line that was original in uh, the initial starting of the Levites to be a praise team, to be singing to God. When David first made the Levites worshipers at music, this was one of the lyrics they used. And here they are saying these same words, centuries and centuries and centuries later, restoring now the worship of God in this place. It's just an awesome, awesome moment. And, and it's, it's strange, too, because here you have all these people gathered. All they've built is the foundation, and they're shouting, they're carrying on, they're praising. You've got cymbals clashing. You've got horns blaring. And then the old people start weeping and wailing because they can tell, based on the foundation, this is going to be nothing like the temple they remembered from when they were kids. And they're sad. So the, the really old people who, who like remember the old one, they're sad. The young people are all thrilled. And there's a confusing sound ringing out. In chapter 4, the plot thickens. We get opposition. Chapter 4, verse, 40, chapter four, verse 4 says, Then the people of the land, that's a, a term for the people that are not part of this refugee Resettlement. These are other people that were already in the land, probably from other countries that got settled there because everybody got swapped around. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. And they bribed officials to frustrate their plan throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of King Darius of Persia. So Zerubbabel... Um, had been approached by these people, and they had requested to participate in building the temple, and Zerubbabel has said to them, no, no, God has given us to build this temple, and the king has authorized us to build this temple, we, we don't, no thanks. And they got upset, um, and they, they frustrated the, the, the building. I don't know what that means. Is that terrorism? Do they like just like break stuff when everyone was sleeping. I don't know. But somehow they got the construction project to stop, and they, they worked with the, uh, the government through bribery to get the government to deauthorize the construction project. Because let me tell you, if the government doesn't want you to build, they can shut you down even today, right? If you, if, if you find a, a code violation or you didn't get the building permit, your neighbor calls, man, they'll shut you down real fast until you pay, right? Anyhow, don't get me started about that. Um, so they have legal problems. Now they have legal problems. They can't build. Zerubbabel stopped building, and a year passed. And then another year. And then another year. People moved on with life. They worked the land. They, they worried about their own houses, their own families, their own neighbors, their own situation. They, I'm sure they would gather for the festivals at the foundation of the temple which they had built, but nobody's building anymore. They adjusted to the new normal. And then we read in Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now Haggai the prophet 
And Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. It had been 15 years. 15 years, and now God works through these prophets, through Haggai and through Zechariah, and he, and, he, and he inspires them to say to the people, it's time to build. I see you've got a nice house. What about God? He doesn't have a nice house. His house is just a foundation. What's the matter, you? Let's build. Let's go, people. And you know who listens to Haggai? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel listens. And, you know, you can, you can imagine as, a, as an official leader of the people that Zerubbabel has great concerns because as soon as they start to build, what about the Persian authorities? The government is coming. They're going to shut us down. It's going to be bad. We're going to get fined. We're going to get arrested. We could get killed. And yet he said, I will do it. There was a man who stood up, and his name was Zerubbabel. Look at verse 2. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, set out to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. And so as soon as they start building, somebody lets, you know, this is just the way life is. Somebody lets the government know. They're like, oh, by the way, uh, we notice these Jewish refugees are like rebuilding the temple. Is that authorized by you? Did you guys authorize that? Did we authorize that? So immediately they get ratted out, and now the government, and it's, now it's been 15 years. We've actually had uh, three kings since the original one that started this project, and it's not like the king's anywhere nearby. He's 900 miles away in Babylon, and in Persia, which is even farther than Babylon, now that I think about it. Um, and so they're going to send a letter, and they're, you know how governments work. So we're going to send a letter, it's going to be an official letter, and we're going to ask for an investigation to be made. Meanwhile, Brother Zerubbabel's over there. Let's get that stone from the quarry. Let's get it down here. Let's get that, let's get that lumber milled. We got those cedars of Lebanon. They've been doing nothing for all these years. Let's mill those suckers. Let's cut them to the right shape. And, and they're building. You can hear the hammers going while all the bureaucracy is just slowly grinding its way all the way to Persia and then all the way back with these, um, uh, these, op this, these opposers of the plan. So Darius is now the king instead of Cyrus. Cyrus is long dead. Darius I is now the king. These are real kings. You can look them up in history books. Um, and he, he says, all right, well, what's the story here? And what they report to him is that we went to the site where they're building this temple, and we asked them, who gave you permission to build this? And what are your names? Sounds just like our modern inspectors, right? And uh, so they, they say, you all, we have permission from Cyrus. Fifteen years ago, Cyrus, the great Persian, you know, the founder of the Persian Empire, he's the one that gave us permission. So we're just doing what, what Cyrus said. So then now uh, Darius is the king. He's like, you know, let's, let's see if it's true. Let's check the archives. They check the archives, nothing. So then he's like, you know what, we do have this off-site archive location in another, in another place. Let's go, let's send somebody over there to check, a place called Ekbatana. And they go there, and, and they're looking in the archives, and they find an old scroll, and it's the declaration of Cyrus about building this temple. They find it. And so Darius writes back to the local governor in the region, and we actually have the letter he wrote. Check it out. It's chapter 6, verse 6. It's right in our text, preserved all these years later. Chapter 6, verse 6. Now you, Tatnai, governor of the province beyond the river. So that's the Euphrates River. And uh, so this is a whole region, a whole massive region of the empire, what they would consider to be the west of, of uh, Persia. By the way, Persia is modern-day what? Iran. That's right, yeah. Uh, there's a few few countries probably combined for that. Uh, look at that, chapter 6, verse 6. Now you, Tatnai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bozani, and you, their associates, the envoys in the province beyond the river, keep away. Oh, that's a good first two words, keep away. Leave those, leave those builders alone. Verse 7. 
Verse 7, let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews, and the, that's Zerubbabel, and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these people in full and without delay from the royal revenue. Hello. The tribute of the province beyond the river. This is incredible. Think about this. When's the last time a government stopped a building project, came back and said, you know what, uh, you can resume, and here's some extra money to help with costs. This, this is not, this never, this is not, this, this is not a thing, right? So now he's going to take tax money and use it to help fund not only the construction of the building, but also supplying it with the animals needed for their whole worship system. Look at this, verse 9. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil as the priests in Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail so that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his children. See, the king always, you know, he knows what he's doing. It's like, we're going to underwrite this, but uh, you say a prayer for me and my kids. <laughs> and I'm sure the Jewish people were like, sure, we'll pray for you and your kids. <laughs> no problem. Verse 11, furthermore, I, declare, I decree that if anyone, this is my favorite part, if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of the house of the perpetrator who then shall be impaled on it. Whoa. The house shall be made a dunghill. May the God who has established his name there overthrow any king or people who shall put forth a hand to alter this or to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. Woo! Zerubbabel, what do you think he, how do you, how do you think he responded to this news? Like, here comes, here comes the delegation of the Persian government, and they're like, we heard back from the king, and Zerubbabel's like, oh gosh, I'm in a critical spot here. I got, you know, A-frames, you know, working up on the, or trusses on the, on the roof. Everything is precarious, you know, like, I need, to, I need to get back to work. And they say, uh, you're allowed to build, and now we have to help you. <laughs> you know, what, like, what was that news like to receive? Did he dare imagine the Persians would do that? But Zerubbabel trusted in God, and he persevered. He persevered, he persevered. That is the big thing about Zerubbabel. Uh, just getting there to the land took incredible perseverance. You pack up 50,000 people and travel 900 miles. I don't care how many donkeys you have. That's, that's going to be difficult, okay? And, and uh, then they, getting all the, the supplies, just getting the supplies from, from Tyre and Sidon all the way down to Jerusalem, and then, you know, Jerusalem's actually on a hill, so you have to get them up the hill at the end of the trip, and, you know, getting everything, and then now dealing with all the bureaucracy and getting approval from the government, and now, finally, this thing is building. This is a lifetime of perseverance of this man who said, it is in my heart to build a house of God, and I will not stop until it's done. I will persevere. And yeah, there was a hiatus. There was a period of time where he took a break. You know what I mean? Uh, but then he broke that hiatus when the, the messengers of God prophesied to him. It says in, uh, well, let's look at uh, verse 17. They offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, then they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. They finished it. The year was 516 B.C. We have like fairly good sense of like time then because the Persians kept track of, of years, and they dated everything based on what year of the Persian king it was. So yeah, we think it was about 516 B.C. The temple was destroyed in 586 B.C., and it was rebuilt 516 B.C., 70 years. There was no temple. God had his sanctuary. Think about that. that, that it's just an incredible thing. 
And, and this temple that Zerubbabel supervises the building of is built in 516 B.C. It stands for 586 more years till the year 70. Can you, build it, can you imagine a building that lasts another 580 years? Sure, it got renovated uh, around a little before the time of Christ. It got renovated, right? But it's still his building. 600 years this building stood. It's incredible. You know what was happening 600 years ago? You know, you, you know what was going on in the United States 600 years ago? There was no United States. Columbus hadn't even sailed the ocean blue. 600 years is a long time for a nation, much, much less a, a building. I, I guess in Europe they've got houses that are like, ridiculously older than that even, and they're just like, oh, it's only 600? <laughs> <laughs> but in this country, that's a big deal, right? 600 years. And that was the Zerubbabel. That was the Zerubbabel who said, I will persevere. I will take a stand. I will deal with all the complexities of logistics and failure, and I will keep going. And they did this dedication. I love this dedication we just read. They offer all the, these animal sacrifices. A lot of times you offer animal sacrifices. That also includes a barbecue. That also includes eating as a people, smoked and, and roasted meat. So if you're vegetarian, this might not appeal to you. But if, if you are uh, a meat eater, this, these, are, these are some good times. These are, these are times where it's, it's, it's a thrilling uh, feast. And over time, other Jews, after they saw that that temple was built, the ones back in Babylon, they said, you know what, let's go back. And so there was a whole second migration under a man named Ezra that happened after this. And then there was a third migration under a man named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was the one that built the walls around the city. So now they actually had protection. But it was Zerubbabel who got the ball rolling and who persevered through thick and thin to get this temple built. It reminds me of another story, of a story of a man in this country, a man named Clarence Jordan. I wonder if any of you have ever heard of Clarence Jordan. Uh, he, he was born in 1912 in Georgia, Talbotton, Georgia. I have no idea where that is. Actually, no, I did, I, that's not true. I looked it up on a map. Uh, I've never been there, but I looked it up on a map. It's about two hours south of Atlanta. So the Clarence Jordan was born in 1912, and uh, you know, he, he, he saw all the poverty around him. This is, this is uh, 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 the South uh, after the Civil War. So uh, the Civil War is in the 1800s, and the, so he's in the early 1900s growing up as a boy in, in southern Georgia, and he sees all the sharecroppers, and that's where you have a rich person who owns the land, and then poor people do all the work on the land, and then share their crops with the rich person. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an exploitative economic system. It's, it's not really good. Like, maybe it was good to, like, get your start, but, you know, it, it wasn't working well. By the time Clarence Jordan was a boy, he saw the exploitation, he saw the poverty, and he saw a severe amount of racism. And it really bothered him. And he decided he would learn to be a farmer. So he went to the University of Georgia, and he got a bachelor's degree in farming. Learned all the modern techniques of, you know, and the other problem with the so was the soil had been totally depleted from the cotton, uh, all the cotton plantations, all the cash crops. So you couldn't just grow stuff anymore. It was, it was in need of a lot of work. And then he thought, thought to himself, you know what, I think this is actually not just an economic problem. I don't think this is a technological problem alone dealing with the farming situation. I think it's also a spiritual problem. And he said, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get a master's degree and study the New Testament. So he went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He got a THM. And he said, you know what? I still don't feel like I know enough. Went back for a PhD in Greek New Testament. Got his PhD in Greek New Testament. Kind of a, a Jerry uh, mindset there. You know, just like, ah, maybe, a PH, maybe a PhD would help. You know, um, and uh, so yeah, he, go, he goes, he gets that PhD in the Greek New Testament. He says, "All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go be the change I want to see in the world." 
And uh, he, met, he had met a wife and had a child while he was in seminary, and he met another couple. And, and all together, they, they went back to Georgia, these uh, two families, and they bought a 440-acre far- plot of land. And uh, that's the tractor he drove. Not really. Uh, but it is an old, old beat-up tractor, so why not show a picture of it? It's also in the public domain, so I don't get sued. So it's like two, two pluses right there. Anyhow, this is actually a picture of the land uh, that he bought. And uh, so it's 440 acres in southern Georgia. Um, I think it's Americus, Georgia, is like the nearest town to it. And it was a rural place. And they decided that they wanted to call their farm Koinonia because that's from the Greek word that means community or fellowship or sharing. And they decided to live in total, uh, total sharing among each other with the money. So there, w- there, was, uh, there was no, nobody had money. You know, they all shared their resources. And the first thing they did once they got the farm started is they invited some black people to live with the white people on the farm. They wanted to have a uh, multiracial farm. They wanted, to, um, they wanted to live out the New Testament. And this caused major problems. This caused major problems because now when he bought the farm, it's 1942. And for a few years, it was okay. But then the 1950s and the 60s rolled around. And there was a, uh, a lot of persecution that Clarence Jordan faced. And I, I bring up Clarence Jordan to you, not, not just because he was like a man way ahead of his time, like Martin Luther King Jr. was very impressed with Clarence Jordan, actually, because like Clarence was already doing this stuff 20 years before uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was. But um, I don't bring it, that up for you. It's because he persevered. That's why I bring this up. Because when the persecution came, Clarence Jordan didn't say, all right, we tried it, but it didn't work. You know, he, he said... We will stay. Over and over, he said, we will stay. He had been attending a local church. At his local church, the the pastor said to him, I don't want you coming here. Go away. And Clarence Jordan and his wife and this other couple, they said, well, we don't want to go away. You're the only church nearby. We live out out in the country. Like, we were just going to keep coming. They kicked him out of that church. Why? Because they had... Black people and white people living together. That's the, that's the reason why. They're racist against, and they're, and they're supposed to be Christians. These are Christians and Christians. So, you know, that's a little confusing, right? But they get kicked out of the church. Well, they decide we're still going to stay. And then it gets real because they go after them economically. So when you have a farm, you have to buy supplies and like big quantities of supplies. And now everybody in the community knows that these guys are, they're not segregationalists like they are, and so they don't want to sell to Koinonia Farm. They don't want to sell to Clarence Shorten. So Jer- Clarence, Clarence Shorten will go to buy a, a bunch of lime and, you know, to spread on his fields, and the guy says, well, I can't sell you that. Why can't you sell? I can see it right there. What's wrong with my money? You think my money's no good? No, no, you, 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 you kick the black people off and we'll sell it to you. No problem. So now he's got to travel to another county to buy things where they don't know him or just go without. And still, they decide, you know, we're going to stay. We're going to persevere because it's the right thing to do. This is what Christ has taught us. Well, then they came to the notice of a certain organization at the time called the Ku Klux Klan. And they started to get threatened by the KKK. And uh, so what Clarence Jordan did was he sent a telegram to President Eisenhower. And he alerted President Eisenhower that they were in danger of, I don't think they would have used the word terrorism back then, but that's basically what it was. They were a ter- the KKK was a terrorist organization. Uh, they're in danger of getting killed. They're Americans, they're taxpaying Americans, you know, like they want to be defended. So President Eisenhower uh, alerted the governor of Georgia to deal with it. He said, you, you know, you figure this out, this is your state. The governor of Georgia was a racist, so he reported them to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation who investigated the farm on the charge of communism instead of trying to help them. So now they had governmental persecution in addition to the KKK and getting kicked out of church and economic boycotts. 
Clarence and his wife Florence, with the other couples, had to decide what to do. Should they stay or should they go? Should they say, you know, this is just too hard. We can't do this farm. You know, let's just go and, you know, Clarence Jordan can get a job anywhere. He's got a PhD. Like, he'll be fine. But what about all these other people? What about them? And so they decided they wanted to persevere. Clarence Jordan said, let us persevere. Let us persevere. Let us stay. Let us fight. Well, then it got worse. One Thursday night, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden they heard gunfire. The KKK came through with machine guns and shot up the buildings in a drive-by shooting and then left. They got up in the morning. They see all the bullet holes. And Clarence Jordan says, let us persevere. Let us stay. A week passes, same thing happens. They come through, they're shooting up the place. You know, this is life and death at this point. You have machine guns blasting your place. The KKK takes dynamite. Somehow they were connected in with like the National Reserve, so they had access to weapons. They took dynamite, they blew up the produce stand that they used to sell their produce. I mean, at what point do you say, all right, well, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And you say, well, you know, we're going to die. And, and here, but here's the thing. When you have that level of conviction, you say, you know what? I am willing to die. This is the right thing to do, and I'm going to stay. And so the third week rolls around, and uh, a few, few of these white guys come to the farm, and they ask to speak to Clarence Jordan. And they, they sit down together, and uh, they, they say, you know, I heard you've been having some trouble here lately. And Clarence says, yeah, yeah, a couple of... A couple of nights, you know, these guys have been shooting up the place. He said, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. And they start describing exactly what happened and what buildings were shot at. And Clarence realizes these are the shooters. They're sitting right there. And then they say to him, unless you get the black people off the property, and I'm sure they didn't say black people, by the way, if you, unless you get them off the property, the sun is not going to rise on this farm tomorrow. That's what they said to him. Clarence is sitting there. He's a Southerner. They're Southerners. He's got to respond. And he says to them, you know, in seminary they told me there were boys like you, but I never believed it. I heard there were boys like you, but, you know, I just never thought I'd meet them. I get to meet men who have the power to stop the sun from rising. This is incredible. I really want to meet you. And he cracks a joke. <laughs> like, totally ridiculous, right? He cracks a joke. They start laughing. It lightens the tension a little bit. And he notices uh, one of the guys has a, a wedding ring on. He says, hey, you got any kids? The guy says, yeah, I got some kids. He said, you know when the kid's a baby and the baby's crying at night and it's, oh, isn't that, isn't that so hard? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, that's really hard. That's a tough time of life. You know, and the baby's crying. And he's like, you, know, you ever have it where the baby got sick for a little while? And then, you know, it's, it's like up one night. And then the next night, the baby's up again another night. And you still got to go to work the next day. This guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just the worst, man. Oh, I hate that. He said, you know, we got a baby here. And the baby's a little sick. And the baby is up all night. But the parents, you know, they got to get up and they got to farm in the morning. And when you guys drive through here with your machine guns, you're waking up that baby. What do you want to do that for? And they left, and they never came back. You know, you can't quantify the Spirit of God when it's at work in someone. You can't, set, you can't bottle that and use that same exact line in your situation, right? I mean, try it, sure. But, you know, the, the fact is, he persevered, and then when the time came for the negotiation, God was with him to give him the words to say so that he could end the violence. At least the machine gunning part of the violence, you know, the economic stuff went on for years and years. And so a few years after that, another couple came to visit Clarence Jordan, uh, Millard and Linda Fuller, and they started together what they called partnership housing. They decided they wanted to build affordable homes for poor people at no interest mortgages. This, uh, this couple lived there with Clarence Jordan for a few years, and then they decided of all places in the world to go, to the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the 70s, which was called Zaire. 
and uh, they wanted to establish affordable housing there and do this partnership thing. So they did that for three years, and they came back, and they founded an organization called Habitat for Humanity, which has built, in the in last year alone, 13.4 million people. They, they built enough homes to improve the lives of 13.4 million people. All in, since 1976, when Habitat for Humanity was founded, they have helped 59 million people. This is, you know, this, nobody's ever heard of Clarence Jordan, but he's the guy that started this community. He stayed, and then he, he, he was trying to do Christianity, trying to live out his faith, and he's like, you know, these poor people need houses, and he worked with this other couple, got them launched, and boom, we have this whole other organization that has happened because Clarence Jordan persevered, because Zerubbabel persevered. Zerubbabel persevered. He got that temple done. That temple stood for 586 years. Clarence Jordan stayed, and you know, he had an impact in his local area for sure. He brought in a lot of modern farming techniques, really brought the, brought the technology and everything else. But you know what else he did? He brought a witness to Christ that said, my brother and my sister, regardless of my race or their race, they persevered and they're faithful. So I want to ask you the question, just winding down here, I want to ask you the question, what work is God calling you to do and how can you persevere in your life? Sometimes it's not some big fancy thing where you're an influencer with millions of followers. Okay, Sometimes you're just dealing with a government that is difficult to build a building. Sometimes you're just trying to have a farm to survive, right? That's, that's what these guys did. It wasn't glamorous, but they were faithful. And so I think this is a lesson for you. Are you serving God? Then stay faithful in that service. I want to speak to the parents for a moment. If you have kids, raising those kids takes a lot of faithfulness, doesn't it? A lot of perseverance. A lot of not giving up. And even after they're, they leave the house, I'm, I'm told, uh, there's still more work to be done. You know? And you know, perseverance is important in life. So do what God calls you to do. Let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so impressed by the example of those who have gone before us that have persevered against great trials and tribulations and even threats to their life. We ask that you would help us to persevere, that you would help us to live out our faith authentically in our own time. We pray that you would give us faithfulness, that you would help us to be able to stick with it over the long haul and honor you in the process. We pray this and. We ask you to bless our week in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.